Leona coming through is a little bit surprising, I will admit. You don't usually think of like Leona as being the champion you want to pair with the Seraphine, but mm -hmm. When DePaul is picking Kaisa early, it usually telegraphs that they want to play a very all any uh, kill lane, bot lane, with this Alistar pick coming through, right? So Leona can really preempt that and give you a lot more 2v2 potential, right? Yeah, I completely agree. I will say, I, I personally am a fan of leaving that Seraphine as that true flex, not necessarily locking in your bot lane, especially now with that Yone, it's starting to really... Uh, put this composition together, but we're already seeing a ton of team fighting out of Butler and DePaul, that scrappy, brawly dive style. Yeah, I definitely think Seraphine support stocks are going way down. Uh, mm -hmm. She got her healing reduced by a pretty significant amount. So I think teams are really priced into going that Seraphine bot lane. But yeah, the flex central is definitely there, especially into Misfortune, who's not in this game. I think Seraphine support really shines. Uh, Caitlyn and Misfortune, because it just allows you to contest the wave clear. But with these bans coming through, very surprising. We're seeing mid lane bans coming through from DePaul, so they are predicting Yone is going to be a top laner here, and they're banning out Levi's Akali, which notably he is really good at, and Akali is super strong right now. She's seeing play at Worlds, she's seeing plays across competitive like amateur leagues, she's just doing performing incredibly well. Yeah. Akali stocks are up, Seraphine yeah. support stocks are down, <laughs> yeah. and I really like sort of how these teams are developing, because they're certainly moving, gravitating mm. towards pretty distinct identities, especially with that trundle picked up by DePaul, it's definitely going to be uh, up Reaper's Alley, and we actually see the Casio picked up uh, by Butler for Levi, I'm wondering if this is also just a pick away from Agister, because he is a very big Casio player. Casio is really good here. We haven't seen a lot of Cassio in the recent meta, but Cassio thrives at disengaging against short-ranged team comps, right? So when you see Kaisa, Aatrox, Alistar, Trundle, Cassio looks really amazing. But I do think Anivia, if this gets locked in, is an amazing counterpick to it. And of course, we we obviously have to talk about Ramus being locked in, yes. right? Into <laughs> Kaisa, Aatrox, Trundle, right? Um, everyone really wants to be building heavy AD and auto-attacking. However, I actually think this might be a little bit of a bait because Ramus notably stacks up like three, four, five hundred armor. Mm -hmm. And so if he eats a Trundle R, not only is that going to make Trundle incredibly hard for the Yone to touch, it's also going to make the Ramus be made of paper because once those temporary stats wear off, you still have the drain effect based on when the Trundle ultimate was cast. So champions like Ramus or Sejuani who get those big temporary stat increases can actually literally go into the negatives in their resistances sometimes. Oh my god. Uh, that's that's disgusting. But I was um, yeah. really thinking on, along those lines of mm -hmm. you see that there's a Trundle on the other side. You know you're playing into Subjugate and... Yeah. If you just press R at the right time, if you're Reaper, this Ramus is useless. Yeah, okay. So the thing is, right, when we look at the comps, the Ramus will be suffering from the subjugate, right? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, Trundle really doesn't get armor value at all here, right? It's a Cassiopeia, it's a Seraphine, and Yone deals about one third ish magic damage and another pretty significant amount as true damage, right? So mm -hmm. this is a very low value game for getting armor. So while I think the Trundle does have a very positive matchup into this Ramus, I do think it's a little worse just because of the damage compositions here than it may first seem. Yeah, I can definitely see that where really that armor value is only one directional because this trundle you're not getting any value off of that cassia with the armor you're not getting any value against the seraphine and with how big this team fight is you could just get shredded to pieces if there is miasma on top of stacking twin fangs for the cassia if there is a huge encore and i'm just wondering how DePaul, because it feels that they're really relying on getting ahead early, on starting to scrap things up, and if Butler can slow the game down, they just have a better team fight, in my opinion. Yeah, I think Butler has just really crazy engage potential. I think there's so many avenues for them to engage, and the counter engage from the side of DePaul is very situational, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's an Anivia wall, it's an Alistar headbutt, it's a Trundle pillar, but all of these are sort of things that 
split the team fight in half, right? Where like the immobile champions can't get in because they're walled off. And then you turn and 5v2, 5v3 the divers. The problem is excluding the Cassiopeia, that's not really a problem for anyone. Like Ramis R's in, Leona gets in, Yone gets in, Seraphine doesn't need to get in. She has so much range that even if she gets walled off and zoned out, she's going to contribute a lot. And so Cassio is sort of the only real issue. But then if we look at these team compositions, right, they don't have the range to abuse splitting the fight like that either, right? Like if you wall off the Cassiopeia, you, you're not going to deal damage to her like she's just still just gonna run around the wall at you and uh you can't just like poke her out from out of range i think there's some pretty serious issues just in terms of like if depaul engages on butler it has to be a perfect engage right you mm -hmm. need to be getting like on the seraphine and blowing her up instantly but Butler has a lot less pressure when they're engaging onto DePaul. I feel like a lot more things can go wrong for this Butler comp and still end up okay. Versus DePaul, I think the execution needs to be perfect. Yeah, I completely agree. Where this DePaul team, it's a lot of power picks and it's a lot of uh, scrap potential, mm -hmm. but there isn't a clear engage outside of headbutt pulverize. And if you're not landing that onto the Seraphine in the late game, that doesn't matter. It's yeah. not going to have any realistic impact. And so if this Trundle isn't going crazy in the early game, if this Aatrox isn't just completely winning the solo lane, and as we already know, Yoni's a pretty solid matchup into the Aatrox. If that's not just crushing from the get-go, then how does DePaul even play this game? Because it doesn't feel like they have any options. Because again, it's it's that perfect engage or that perfect Anivia wall for the pick. Yeah, I mean, the answer basically comes down to DePaul is going to need to keep uh, lane pressure with their wave clear, right? Kai'Sa mm -hmm. has pretty good wave clear. Anivia obviously has amazing wave clear. And so they need to wave clear uh, about a minute before an objective spawns and then get into the pit so that Butler has to walk into them, right? If Butler is ever in the pit first, DePaul can never contest it, right? There's no way to get through choke points on DePaul's team so you need to be the ones controlling the chokes. And then if you have that right, you can put up the Anivia walls. You can put up the Anivia Rs. If people have to jump into Alistar, right, Alistar's feels great. If people have to jump into the Trundle, Trundle feels great. The problem is, right, the Anivia zoning doesn't really matter against Butler, right? right. Like, Yone ER is just going to go straight past Anivia wall blizzard, right? Like, yeah. It's going to be so hard to actually keep Butler out. So they really just need to get an early game lead, right? The way I see mm -hmm. DePaul winning this game is this is a pretty fragile bot lane for Butler, right? Seraph mm -hmm. and Leona, there's a lot of potential for things to go wrong against Alistar Kaisa, especially when the jungler is an early game powerhouse like Trundle. So what could happen is Seraph and Leona try and push up to keep lane prio because they want to go invade because Ramis is going to beat up Trundle. So they mm -hmm. want to invade. So they're going to keep lane prio. And during that window, there's going to be an engage opportunity where Seraphine just gets blown up before they're able to like empowered shield themselves or flash away mm -hmm. or do anything. And then if Kaisa gets two early kills, especially if she takes a uh, cheap shot, which mm -hmm. or not cheap shot, uh, treasure hunter, which is pretty standard for AD carries nowadays, mm -hmm. it can really snowball out of control and get out of hand. But when I look at this DePaul comp, it feels bad that I have to keep coming up with these sort of like very specific <laughs> scenarios where things can go right. Whereas I look at DePaul and I go, you know, they can kind of just do whatever and it'll probably work. Yeah, that's very true. The the compositions really favoring Butler, but mm -hmm. DePaul certainly have some scrappy options, can certainly try to get ahead early, but we won't be able to know until we're on to the rift as we've just got a few more moments on that spectator delay. We'll be wrapping that up for you guys. We're going to cut to a quick break so we can get the lobby, get this map, get everything perfectly set up for you guys. And we will be right back with the kickoff of the Big East LOL season with this match between Butler and DePaul. You're not going to want to miss it. And welcome back. We've got Butler in the blue, DePaul in the red, as it's team fight versus scrap. And the only way that we can really see DePaul 
winning this game is through an early lead. So we're going over some scenarios in draft. Now, what do we want to see out of these two teams as they just five point and get set up for a neutral game state? I would really love to see Reaper start topside this game and try and path bot. I think your top laner is going to be crying in chat. He's going to be whining and saying, I'm counterpicked, I'm counterpicked, this is awful. But sometimes you really just need to like weak side and go play for your win condition. And I really do think that this Kai'Sa has to be the win condition for the side of DePaul. So I think that we really should see Reaper starting topside and pathing down, but of course that's not what we're getting. Um, early game, some other notable stuff going on. I always like to check summoner spells and runes, right? Uh, cleanse on the Kai'Sa is going to be incredibly important into this Ramus especially. It's good into Seraphine, it's good into Leona, right? But into this Ramus, Ramus yes. will literally one-shot you if you're a lethal tempo attack speed stacking AD carry if you don't have cleanse. You need that to be able to play the team fight at all. So I really like that King Amazon had the foresight to take that. The lethal tempo as well has emerged very recently as Kai'Sa technology. We saw Hail of Blades for a very long time as the premier Kai'Sa rune, and every once in a while you would see PTA. But there's a much more of... I'd call it a vein style Kai'Sa, I guess, where you play around your E invisibility and kiting around as opposed to that hardcore burst combo that we used to see from Kai'Sa. And I think it's really strong if the team fights extend and go long, and when there's, you know, Seraphine, Leona, Ramis, uh, Yone, we're gonna see those long team fights. So I also like the rune choice here. Yeah, I really, really like it as well. You have that extension. And also, if this Kai'Sa has to be your win condition, you can't just be relying on that Hail of Blades burst. You can't just be relying on a PT and one champion. You need to have that just sustained DPS. So most things going as we expect across the board. Both junglers moving towards their top side. Reaper does get spotted out. So Butler have some information to work with. How do you think that they want to avoid this trundle with him really being one of those points of agency for DePaul this game? I mean, I think that Ward is a very good start, right? If you track the trundle and you make sure he doesn't get early plays, I think Ramus is going to be a lot more useful later on in the game just because so much of your priority is based on this hard auto attack as we have a gank top lane. Gank top side. Malin just gets the knockout. He actually gets brought back in, and that's going to be a quick first blood on the Malinich. As well, this Kais is your win condition. Aatrox getting yeah. ahead certainly doesn't hurt. Aatrox getting ahead is very important. Not only is Aatrox sort of a premier carry, once Aatrox starts snowballing this matchup, he can win it by himself. Aatrox can absolutely take over a game like this. Notably, he doesn't auto attack a lot, so the Ramus, even though the Ramus will have a lot of armor, it won't actually shred Aatrox's health that much. You won't be chain autoing it, which is very nice as well. And the other option that the Paul gets here is you can get this Aatrox ahead and then leave him alone in this top lane where he should be counterpicked. But now that he has a summoner advantage and an item lead, it's going to be soloable and you can focus even more on bot lane as he is in trouble in the top side though. Looking yeah, at, he... at this lane gang from Ramus, the camera's uh, not cooperating. Yeah, I was gonna say, direct the oh, camera. Gotta love it. Oh, and we're top side! There we go. And oh, actually, wait, they're turning it though. Reaper's here in time. They're turning it. Reaper's around. He was hovering, went to Krugs, but instead, nothing's going to become of that gank. Natog did flash during the exchange, though, to escape out, yeah. that pillar. So, again, another summoner lead for DePaul. Yeah, I think it's going really well for DePaul here in this early game, which is when they need to make things happen. Mystics also having a roam top lane. Levi has no idea. He's going to get headbutted into the Anidia. Oh, headbutted into the stun, and there's the James CC wall on top of it, and the Ignite will take down. Agistair picks up a kill, and a couple really solid roams get DePaul up early. Yeah, incredibly well played. That's one of the core issues with this Seraphine Leona lane, right, is you just don't have kill threat. The Leona's really good at holding off the Alistar from making a play onto you as there's not I can talk. Oh no, Papa Jacer 
stepping forward, but didn't realize there was a Troll King ready and waiting. And well, Nettog is trying to find an escape, it's just not enough, but it was enough for Jester to escape. So at the very least, not another kill going into DePaul's pockets. Yeah, Jester makes it out, but once again, Reaper is just at every single plague, and he's not even falling behind on CS because Nat Dog is trying to move around and match these uh, ganks. But Trundle at that level 3, level 4 mark is just going to be so much more useful in a 2v2 or 3v3 scenario, and so Nat Dog just has to keep conceding pressure. Got that slap, slap, slap from the Trundle as he yeah. really wants to try and make this advantageous, but Malinich now level 6, trying to back, but feels forced to stay. Doesn't realize Levi's on the roam up, but... He's gonna we'll force just... off of his tower, but there's no dive here, so it's just gonna be a recall and teleport back. And finally, Malinich is gonna be able to spend that first blood gold he has. He's gonna be coming back with 400 golden items advantage over Noodley, and that's when things are gonna start feeling pretty awkward. Yeah, this is definitely scary. Is... is... At about the 200 gold lead with that first plate being taken, so not feeling too bad for Noodley, and will back to actually have that uh, item equality. But beyond that, across the board, still about a 1k gold lead in favor of DePaul. So while they're not super far ahead in any one spot, the entire map is just going in their favor. Yeah, I mean, even now, Malinich gets a bit of a reset off, right? He's able to TP back and catch the wave, shove it in time. It's going to be Noodley missing some minions, missing some EXP, and. There's a Dirk in two consorts in Malinix inventory, Whoa. so this Eclipse Aatrox build is so deceptive because you'd think, oh, you know, it's a lethality stacking champion, he's going to be kind of fragile, but he actually heals his entire health bar four times over in the course of the team fight. He's actually really durable and hard to kill while also pumping that lethality damage. And Yone is not going to be able to index into any early armor. You really need to get that early shield, though. You, I've seen Death Stand second before IE second before, but that's kind of an edgy build. It's going to be really awkward as there may be a bait. Nidalee might go in on this. He does. Reaper's here. Looking to go in. and does get pulled in. Force the ulti away, but the pillar for the stop and the continuation as the Flash knock up and Reaper gets the second kill on the Noodley. And this could just be a couple more plays for Malinich, and that gold lead continues to grow. That's such a horrendous death for Noodley. It's like two full waves here, and probably going to be two plays going over the way of Malinich as well. He's being punished so hard for that first death, right? All of this comes from dying that first time when he saw Reaper taking his red buff, right? He knew he was in the area, but he got caught as he was going toward the bush. And because of that, he died, gave a gold advantage to his laner, lost his teleport, and now we see the ramifications of not having your teleport here. It's just feeling brutal, but on the other side of the map, Matzog does answer the pressure with a dragon pig, and Reaper is down a solid two, three camps here, as he's been spending a lot more time in lanes than that dog has. Yeah, but he does have that kill and assist to make up for it, oh, and of for course, sure, yeah. top side, enabling Malinish once again, did pick up two plates, and now has the Herald. I would be surprised so far up just... again. Oh no, no Noodley is on the wrong either. side of the lane, and the World Enders dropped. Knock up from one, but that Spear Dash away is not gonna be enough. Reaper just has to walk it down. Oh, Although stack. Malinish and Reaper are going low. They're getting chunked, but not quite enough. That's going to be another kill. Oh wait, double reset, just spotted. Oh no. And in the bot side, Night Dog wanted a response, but there's just no option, no opportunity. And instead, this is looking to be a commanding lead off the top side. While this Kaisa might not be your carry right now, this Aatrox is certainly enabled as they're gonna get first tower. That's gonna be first tower. That's so brutal because now this opens up the map for Aatrox to go move around and spread his influence, right? A lot of the time, top laners get an individual lead, but they feel very stuck in their own lane. But when you take this top tower, it allows you to go roam to mid, roam to bot, right? We can see just four-man bot plays soon, try and break this bot tower. As Ramus is coming in, but Mystics is just gonna headbutt him away, I think. And certainly do that. Did wait for a moment. Actually, going for the aggressive play, trying to get a kill instead. Mystics, no fear of falling as King of Mason trying to continue this fight is no fear Shakespeare. And instead, no fear. 
Double Stacks double Dash is enough to amaze and somehow finds Nat Dog and now flash away and will survive. I can't believe that worked for King Mason. I thought for sure his hubris was going to get the best of him. I was about to say, Mad Dog still has his ultimate. King Mason has to be careful as he engage here, but the flash, the cleanse gets rid of the taunt and the Seraphine R. The flash R from King Mason gives him that shield and gets him to safety, and is just barely able to put enough damage into Mad Dog to secure the kill and make it out alive. I really love how well played that was. And just across the board, it's such a big individual gap between these players in this game, right? It hasn't been these coordinated team plays where we're seeing four-man dives off of mid-pressure going bot lane. It's just a 3v2 gone wrong, a top laner overextending multiple times, right? It's just individual mistakes adding up, and DePaul is just looking like the more solid team in this early game, but... Even with this 4k gold beat, you do have to be careful looking toward this late game as Mad Dog's caught out again. Oh no, Mad Dog. Gonna go down, the fight continues. Levi pumping out as much damage as possible, and oh no, Reaper falls. The fail flash secures Levi's fate, and now this is gonna be another kill on a pop of Jester, and a double for the Anivia. Now 3 and 0 oh in the mid lane absolutely crushing as again it's just those individual moments as now we might find another newtly able to escape yeah it was just reaper just would not die i think levi thought there would be a fast kill there he got a great two-man stun locking them down in the miasma he was absolutely pumping damage into them but reaper with that divine sunder was able to get off a chomp that healed him then uh, Mad Dog died and his passive kicked in on top of the W giving bonus healing, just plus triumph as well, right? There was just a random 300 health burst heal that went on to Reaper and Butler, and Butler Levi was forced to sink two, three extra fangs into him and that extra time meant he got DPS down and from there, there was just no damage left and they got completely cleaned up. Completely cleaned up is... Now about a 6k gold lead at the 12 and a half minute mark in favor of so DePaul. Big. Certainly showing why they were the number two team out of this conference last season. And 1700 in the top lane, 1k in the jungle, 1700 in the mid lane. These are just massive leads on the entire top side. I mean, yeah, playing in the league last year, right? Reaper was one of the biggest junglers to look out for. I think it was Reaper and Ivor in this rank were two of the really premium players in the league just because they were so good at always being in the right places. And we're seeing that from Reaper this game as well, right? He is not even down that much CS and he's always making his place. Once again, oh. Reaper catching on the other. And this is just vision and quick pillar means Papa Jester is going to fall. And it's a brutal spot to be in when you can't even walk through your own jungle at the 13 minute mark. Yeah, and now uh, DePaul gets the chance to progress the game, right? Whenever you have these early snowballing leads, you see by... Alan is just going to walk away. In. He's cut off. Mad Dog's there as well, but there's a dive bot lane at the same time. It's a good flash by Carthago. Big flash by Carthago, but still there's too much CC. There's too many members and Carthago will fall. But at the very least, oh, does deny oh, one, but Malinix attempts to sew as away and instead is stuck by the taunt, loses the teleport, and now it's a wild chase. But they can survive. So Solar Flare committed, but that is a ton of time used on just one member. But at the very least, Newtly is topside and is starting to chunk down that top tower. Yeah, it's a shutdown to Levi, right, who is the big carry of the team. D1, former Masters player, right? Super mechanically skilled on a very mechanically intensive hyper carry champion. If you're going to get that fat shutdown anywhere, you'd really love it to be on Levi. So we'll have to see what he's able to do with it. But really, just... I'm really so... I can't even see. I'm really surprised the Paul is just giving the Herald over. Butler really capitalizing off of that kill, able to turn it into a Herald. And the main problem I see for the Paul right now 
is they have a big goal lead, right? They're up 5k gold, but they're not really aggressively progressing the game, which is a pretty big fault of their team composition, right? They took the one dragon, but they've been ahead for so long. Bot tower is still standing. Mid tower is still standing, right? Every tick of game that passes, this gold lead gets less significant, right? If both teams gain the same amount of gold over time, the gold lead might stay the same, but the ratio you're up by goes down. So you need to keep getting objectives. You need to actually use your lead to progress the state of the game and turn it into meaningful on-map impact, which is something we're just not really seeing from the side of the ball. They finally get that bot tower, but they've been ahead, so ahead for so long. That's very true, but I will say, it's also a point of they're far ahead enough to the point that they don't need to be taking every fight. So if they were out of position for that Herald, giving that away, while yes, you don't want to give away an objective bounty, it's not the end of the world when they took bot tower, they're about to take mid tower, and this is still a full ring by before 20 minutes. So yeah. at the very least, they are progressing the game in that sense. And now it's going to be a question of how proactive are they before the big purple worm shows up on the rift. Yeah, they're definitely being as proactive as they can be. It's more just this team composition has such a hard time making things happen, right? You can't really play to switch these towers. So if the Butler side just kind of concedes the minimum amount possible and stays safe, they're going to have a chance to scale back in. I definitely am not counting Butler out of this game by any means right now. No, not at all. This game is far from over. While it is a commanding lead for DePaul, they are a team that can struggle to close out games. They are a team that, while topping their group, have often relied on individual performances. So with this team fight composition brought by Butler, if they can survive long enough, there's always that way back. In. There's always that opportunity. So now, actually, this seems to be an attempt to bait out a fight. Baker 2v2, Mathis drops the world ender, and Reapers are right there, ready and waiting for Newly. And he's dropped onto the Reapers. That's a big one to watch. Big burst here comes in. Mathis finds one. Mystics is here for the follow up, and Agister already TP forward, as this is already a lost fight from Butler. As while they were trying to find an opportunity, the pull was one step ahead. Yeah, it looked really good, right? It's a 2v2, you get a lot of damage out on a Reaper early, the teleport starts channeling in, but all of DePaul was already on their way moving up to collapse, and it's a Trundle and an Aatrox. It's so hard to actually kill them fast enough before everyone else gets there. We saw Malinich went down, you know, four or 500 HP, but he hit one Q, two Qs, got that passive auto off, and all of a sudden, he was back at half HP, and ready to keep fighting. Yeah, and I've got a question about itemization from Noodly. Absolutely, yeah. Going for that fork to start things off, it feels like it's just such a concession of tempo and pressure moving forward because you don't have that shield bow and now building a zeal item. I don't know when that shield bow is ever going to get built. Yeah, this zeal is almost certainly going to be turning into a mortal reminder, right? There's so much healing on the side of uh, DePaul, right? You have the Trundle, you have the Aatrox. It's just, you need to be cutting that down. And he does so well with the item anyway, right? He loves the attack speed, he loves the crit. He loves the little bit of AP he gives. It's an item that a lot of Yone's build, even when the enemy team doesn't have a lot of healing. And as for the Bork, it is pretty standard. People do like Bork rushing, but yeah, it is usually Bork into that Shield Bow Infinity Edge that we're used to. As an objective bounty is claimed top lane, that Herald that we saw three minutes ago is being cashed in. And it's a little bit more gold going back the way of Butler, but still, this 7,000 gold lead, it is continuing to grow gradually for the Paul. Yeah, it is continuing, and it's continuing where it wasn't before in the bucket of <laughs> Just one for a huge hair Of course, we're looking for more gold. We're taking a piece of money, fighting the first tank, and then he's following up with the support. And Butler just has to run. They don't have the damage, they don't have the gold. Although the Reaper will fall to Levi. And Newtly, looking for a flanker, just looking for an escape, is gonna back in the face, but will go down and oh, Carthago, you can't step back forward as will be able to escape, but three kills off of Butler's engage for DePaul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it probably will be the Baron. I guess DePaul is choosing to back off. Their health bars are a little low. They're sitting on a lot of gold. They just want to get the resets off. And yeah, in that fight, 
Butler is known as an amazing team fighting team. I think every season we've seen Butler, they have never had the highest ranks, right? Butler individually has always been pretty outclassed by their opponents, but their team play has always been incredible. Right. It's and always been in a standout, fight, absolutely. Absolutely. And in that fight, we saw it happen. That was an amazing engage from Butler, right? It was a uh, R from Remus that got the cleanse and R from Kaisa. It was a Seraphine R that split the team, kept King Amazing in that choke for Noodley's Yone R to come through. But everything landed and no one died. The damage just isn't there. The goal just isn't there. And so even though Butler is executing incredibly well, they've just fallen so far behind from these early game plays that it doesn't matter. Yeah, and the fact that it just doesn't matter how your team play works, how these fights are coming together is a real struggle point for this team that does want to scale back up. But if you continue to take these fights, there just won't be game time anymore as there is still opportunity. There are still these chances, but it's likely going to have to be give the Baron here, but continue to look towards that next engage, whether it's around the inhib or it's layering those ultimates as we saw, because they had the timings, there just wasn't quite the damage. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Seeing Papa Jester trying to recall here, I think T'Pol is instantly going to recognize, you know, we have a Baron timer. It's going to be a 4v5 on the map. We can burn this so fast. We have a two and a half item Kaisa. We can just absolutely shut it. Yeah, we see immediately as soon as Noodley shows on Bali, they go to Baron. Worst case scenario, he has to TP up and walk away and he's wasted his summoner spell. Best case scenario, it's looking like an absolute fool. I think it just has to be a gift here from Butler. You're not facing down Soul too soon, and this is not a position that they're ready to fight. They took the 20 minute fight and it didn't quite work out. Give your Seraphine time to get her Seraphs, let your Cassiopeia hit her third item spike, and there are opportunities. Now that Noodley has that uh, Mortal Reminder, there is that healing reduction, so there's opportunities for Butler for sure, but still, staring down 9k gold is a difficult prospect. Yeah, the main problem, right, is that right now it feels like Butler needs to get a miracle engaged. There's too many strong members on the side of DePaul. Normally, when we see comebacks in these 10k gold lead games, it's when it's like a protect the Cogwa comp, right? A protect the 80 carry comp, where if you get a pick on that 80 carry, it doesn't matter how much gold the rest of the team has. That's very, very true, as now, actually, here's the opportunity of Levi bursting out Agistair. There's no Anivia, there's no ulti. Newly now is in the fight and shut down onto one. A great pickoff for B5, working the way for Butler. King Amazing gets one in response, but where's the continuation? Reaper now looking for the re-engage. Tough to kill. Something to watch, of course, in the top side. Alanit continuing to push down. A Butler finding a way back in to slow things down, but the health is too high and they continue to push. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, right? It's a 4v5. It's a 4v5 team fight. They get the engage onto Agister. They burst him down incredibly quickly, but there's just a second parry there. King Amazing is able to get the heal from the Alistar on the Trundle and take over the fight on his own. And it's just, that's the problem, right? You can't pick off a single key member and then win the fight from there. It's, so that makes it so much harder to actually make anything happen. The trouble is there's so many team members on the exactly. call where King Amazing is so far ahead reaching that third item spike and well yeah Agister does have three right now there's just too many stats for Chung Fu, too many too much damage is now Maladich is in the fight, Papa Jester picked off and cut off as Noodley tries to save him but it will not be enough and now Mystic looks Continue the fight, looks to continue the game. Big encore, but there's no follow up as Nat Dog falls. Levi and Carthago tight, but they can, and they're doing so, so much. Everyone rooted once again. Reaper with the slow, but the carries do survive. So there's an opportunity to save the base. 
Yeah, the problem is it's still a 5v3 on the map, so while there's an opportunity to save the base, it's really not a fight you can take. You have to get this inhibitor, you have to get the other inhibitor and just play for wave clear. It actually looks like the respawns are coming in too fast and DePaul just wants to be safe and back out. And they're just going to opt to take the jungle, get their resets off as this dragon is actually up. Their tempo on the map is a little skewed. I'd love to see how much gold this DePaul lineup is sitting on right now. It has to be about a thousand in everyone's inventory. Yeah, across the board, so much gold. 2,800 gold in King Mason's inventory, right? He's down a full item from where he should be. If there was ever a fight, it would have to be now. Now as the engage follows, Nightdog goes in, they're trying to kill Reaper, but the Grundle just keeps on draining. Papa Jester doesn't land a Solar Flare, but no one's falling yet. Watch Levi and Carthago, those are the ones you need to see. Jester will fight the fucking big Encore, catches two, but it's just the Alistair, no carries our CC point yet. Reaper gets the first kill of the fight, and Papa Jester will fall as well. Once again, a 3v5 and the carries survive. Yeah, it all comes down to Noodley there, right? He went in for the big R onto King Amazon, but King Amazon was able to get out of the way of it, so it only went onto the Trundle. And I think at that point, you know, you say, oh, I'm Yone, I just press E again, I go back, we walk away. It sucks we lost the dragon, but, you know, the engage wasn't there. And in the end, they did keep committing. They kept hitting some big abilities, but... You need everything to line up or else you're just going to get beat by a fat wallet, right? Like those coins, they hurt, you know? They hurt! When you got a bag full of pennies, it does some damage. I don't know, I and, think the ball is sitting on for quarters. Like, uh, they're, maybe, they're they really might be rich enough for quarters, yeah. A silver dollar if you can throw it in. Oh, silver dollar, that, that, that's maybe a little too much. That's Ooh, that's okay. really that, getting That's for there. 20k gold leads, or...? Yeah, 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 that 20k gold lead is one silver dollar. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, you've earned one. Okay, great. But yeah, it's just uh, really great. I love Redemption from Alistar here, by the way. I think Redemption is the best item in the game. Like, actually so incredibly good. Excluding Mythics, right? I think Redemption may literally be the best item in the game. And um, I love building it. Oh! Immunity from that dog. Good escape, I just going to die here, maybe. Maybe! Does flash forward! Nidalee so, so low! There's no life steal from an Immortal Shield, but it does have just enough from the passive and will get the solo kill into Agister. So now, a potential 45 on the base off the reset for Nidalee, but Reaper still finding the start of the fight. Nightdog taunting up the big cow, triple charm, but it's not quite enough. Where's the layered CC? To find more, there's the solar flare, there's the redemption, and that's the big deal that you need to see. Levi cleaning his heart out, but King Amazing is a god, and god like on the rip, looking for more Noodley to fall to the needles, and it's not going to be enough. Carthago and Noodley just sitting back watching their base fall as DePaul wrap their way forward into a game one victory. Yeah, I mean, there was just never a moment in the game where the Paul was behind. We even saw sort of the problems with their comp show through in these late game team fights, right? There were so many moments where it just looked like Butler got the big engage they needed, but the damage just was never quite there. So many people living on 200, 300 HP. And it's just a really clean game from the side of DePaul, right? You got the early game lead, and they knew how to snowball it. They knew how to keep getting more and more kills, and getting more and more picks, and building up so much gold. And in the end, it just absolutely became a dominant showing from the side of DePaul. However, going into game two, I really think, even as much of a stomp as that game was, we cannot count Butler out. I think if a couple things just go slightly different that game, Butler could have absolutely ran it over. If Noodley didn't die at level 2, if uh, the bot play, the Ramus play didn't die, right? Mm -hmm. All these tiny things that snowball into bigger events, if just two of them didn't happen, I think Butler would have completely run over to Paul in teamfights. And so going into the next game, when you have a clean slate, I really want to see what happens. Yeah, same here. I 
am a huge fan of what I saw out of Butler's team fighting because mm -hmm. we saw that layering. We saw those ultimates come into play. We saw Levi able to kite out like an absolute monster. And I think with the right setups and not falling as far behind, not letting Reaper and Malevich just become these giant drain tanks, there are opportunities. They will find those options, but we won't be able to see until we get in the next draft and we get in the next game. Because remember, these are best of threes here in the Big East. So we're going to go to a quick break before we see if Butler can bring it back, force that game three, or if DePaul will have a strong season opener with a 2-0. You're not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned. And welcome back. <coughs> Oh my goodness, excuse me, as we so, just saw DePaul handily take their first game over Butler, but don't count Butler out quite yet, because there's a lot of ways that they can bring this series back. Yeah, absolutely. I think Butler, kind of across the board, has some of the best team fighting in the league, uh, just across the history of the league they've always been the team fighting team and that's super scary to play against because it means every game is losable mm -hmm. definitely it's like every game's losable there's always a way back in and they like to draft uh high team fighting compositions which makes sense to their identity but it also puts you at that risk of if you can't win early fights if you can't skirmish or if you can't stay even in the laning phase you might never reach the point that your team fighting prowess makes a difference. Yeah, that's what exactly what we saw last game, right? There were just too many solo duo deaths going on that they had to concede the second dragon. They got the first dragon, but they had to concede the second dragon. And then by the time the third, fourth dragon were spawning, by the time they had to fight at Baron, it was just too late. They were too far behind. And we saw them getting crazy engages, but the damage was just never there. And so they just have to be more careful in the early game. And I really like this adaptation from DePaul banning out the Seraphine, recognizing that that was a really big problem for them. There were some insane Seraphine Rs that game. Yeah, there were a couple times where if that wallet differential wasn't so big, mm -hmm. that Seraphine makes the difference. It's just an instant 5 for 0 ace, yeah. And they're panning the Yona. Yeah, I respect it. I was so scared for DePaul seeing these champions. But that does mean some of the stuff we saw banned last draft is going to be open, right? The Blitzcrank and the Zac are open, and a jungler who really likes to gank, right? This Ramis player, if yep. he's on Zac, if he has more consistent early ganks, it's going to be scary. Yes, definitely. Uh, a little spooky on the Zac. It's definitely his most played champ. Very, very comfortable mm -hmm. on that pick. But now to Paul, we're seeing the Ornhuffer. If it is locked in, just looking to oh, handshake broken. with that Aatrox. Like, but this is a complete stylistic change for Malinich. It is very different for Malinich, but I mean, it's Orin, man. Like, Orin's broken. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that this Orin pick can pop off. As additionally, I don't think people are talking about it. Orin is a flex. Uh, I had an Orin jungle in my solo queue game yesterday who absolutely popped off. We see Trundle. It's not going to be Orin Jungle, but I think Orin Jungle is actually incredibly sleeper strong. I, I'm i going to be honest. I love Orin Jungle. I remember way back when, the olden days when Orin came out, I was spamming him in the jungle. I wanted him to work because I'm a jungler. I'm not a top laner. I hate sitting on my little island, but I want to play Orin. So I brought him into the jungle. It was tons of fun. You never have to leave the map. You just get to sit and take advantage of your bonus regens, and boom, you, you just win the game, right? Trademark, 100% true. But this is going to be known in the top lane. Trundle once again for Reaper. Lots of comfort. I like that. And for Butler, I like this Lulu pickup because it lets them be more aggressive, and it also helps enable this Aatrox. Yeah, so before Worlds, right, before we saw the Sivir and the Zeri nerfs, Lulu was kind of by far the highest priority support in the game for great reason. She provides so much safety, and she also provides an insane amount of stats. Attack speed boost, move speed boost, on-hit damage, uh, a slow that deals pretty decent damage. Like, Lulu in the early game hurts, yeah. right? So she can scrap in lane. She can. She's like one of the better scaling enchanters, not in terms of like healing and keeping somebody alive, but in terms of making somebody 1v9, she is incredibly powerful. And so if you're planning to play that scaling team fighting uh, composition, Lulu is absolutely the champion you want to go. And additionally, the main answer to Lulu right now 
is picking something like a Caitlyn Lux lane that can shove it in, bully it early, mm -hmm. and make sure that AD carry can never scale. But DePaul was the ones who banned the Caitlyn, so they can't even opt into it. So this Lulu pick feels very hard to punish. Ash is the answer, but Ash is not nearly the same oppressive laner that Caitlyn is. Yeah, nowhere close to it. As we see second round of bans go through, and two ADCs targeted by DePaul, they don't want to see the Cog or the Misfortune come out for Carthago, and have not seen Cogmon in a while, but can definitely understand taking Cog away Lulu? that MF. Yeah. I mean, Cog Lulu is a classic. It's a classic. Yeah, it's a classic. I remember it's watching... Evergreen. I was watching LEC Season 5. That was it. That was all that was picked. It's just Cog Lulu. Cog mm -hmm. Lulu, and you throw Gragas and yeah, Sajuani in the jungle. Season 4 as well, day. yeah. Classic, oh, it's Ash support Ash with a support. Jin. Let's go. I'm here for it. I love Ash support. It's. I'm kind of worried for this team competition. <laughs> like looking at this comp, right? Yeah. What mid laner can you pick here as the Paul that saves this composition? Because right, I'm really worried. Right, who kills Zach? Who kills Aatrox? Jin is famously a very low DPS, high burst AD carry. Right. Mm -hmm. So who deals with this really big frontline from Butler? Your poke Ash is not going to pump damage. Your Jin is not going to pump damage. You have an Orn in the top lane. Your Trundle can put a little bit out, but he's going to be a low econ, you know, competitive, supportive style Trundle. He's not mm -hmm. going to have the damage. And then it's a Kali for Levi being locked in with all of these fragile, squishy AD carries and no consistent lockdown. I think once again... I don't even need to see the fifth champion from DePaul. I think Butler is absolutely destroying draft here. Yeah, very, very strong draft. I wouldn't be surprised if DePaul... I was going to say that they might just go for Agitator's classic right. Casio, but I don't like how that plays into this team composition. I don't hate the Ari, but yeah, I, I will definitely agree with you that this composition from DePaul, they have a lot of pieces. They don't necessarily have a composition and yeah. I also do not see how you cut through both the Aatrox and the Zac because only one of them can get subjugated. Mm -hmm. And then how are you handling a hugeified, buffed up Jinx while an Akali is also ravaging your backline? It just seems very, very difficult to do unless we see DePaul once again just play the early game incredibly well and carry the game from there. I mean, yeah, it's a very reminiscent of last game where we just talked about how good we think Butler's draft is compared to DePaul's. And... I think this game is even more one-sided, right? You needed to pick a high DPS mid laner here, but you also needed an AP mid laner, which takes something like a Yone or a Yasuo or an Akshan off the table. So I don't know, maybe something like a Talia, maybe something like a Silas possibly, a Cassiopeia could have been better, but Ari, Jin, Ash is not what you need to shred through a Zac and an Aatrox. Akali is going to be impossible to lock down. There is zero forms of point-and-click crowd control on the side of DePaul. So Levi is going to run absolutely rampant. There's pretty solid engage. You have Orin, you have Ash, you have Jin. But once again, this is all front-to-back engage, right? This is not flanking engage. So what's going to happen, right, is the Orn Horn is going to come down and it's going to hit Jen, and then you're going to try and follow it up with an Ashar and a Curtain Call, and Zach and Aatrox are just going to eat all of the crowd control, not care, and then Jinx is going to take over. That's certainly what it feels like. The only way that I can see this really working for DePaul is if you have Ash Arrow, you can find a pick onto the Akali or the Lulu and try and snowball the fight from there. But even still, if this Lulu Jinx combo is not disrupted and the Aatrox and Zac can sit as a front line, there's no way that you're ever reaching that Jinx. And she's just going to pop off and get reset after reset. And it's not going to matter how tanky your Orn is. It's not going to matter how many stats your Trundle has stolen because. Jin's never finishing off that kill. This Ari's yeah. never one-shotting that Jinx. And this is Ash support. I said that I loved it earlier in the draft. Not necessarily in this composition, just as a, like a, a plain pick. It's fun to watch. I like the goofiness of it, but I Absolute don't fun, see. Yeah. It's fun. Like, it's a fun yeah. pick. But it's not a Leona here. It's not the hard engage mm -hmm. that Paul might realistically need to try and turn this fight around. Because I can see the angle if you have a Leona and you can go solar flare into Ornhorn, and then you're getting percentage damage on top of that and you're letting your Jin crits 
much more valuable or you're letting your curtain call be that much more valuable. Mm -hmm. But here there's just not that extra oomph that we're seeing out of DePaul. And it just feels like a lot of lackluster damage into a team that realistically isn't going to die. Yeah, traditionally, right? We've seen Ash support as a counterpick to these enchanters, right? It's a poke champion with hard engage. Those are the two things that are really good into enchanters. The problem is, right, that this Zac absolutely ties together the butler composition and it absolutely destroys the DePaul composition. There is a single champion with any form of like valuable mobility on DePaul and it's Ari, right? Or in yeah. kind of like a dash. So we saw Zach, right? We saw Zach when we picked Ash, and we still just thought, like, this guy won't get on me. Like, he's going to get on you. He's Zach. Yeah. Like, right? And then we picked Jin into it as well, as once again, it's like, I don't care how mechanical you think you are, how well you think you're going to be positioning, right? Mm -hmm. This Zach is going to get on your backline. You can't keep him out. And once he's in there, you don't have a way you don't have a way to get away from him, right? I would have loved to see something that has more anti-dive tools and anti-engage tools. Something like Kaisa, who can go invisible in EOA with burst mm -hmm. mobility. Tristana can jump away and stay safe. Sivir can spell shield it. Ash Jin is just these two immobile champions that hate getting dot dove inside the backline. And we pick them into Zach. I just, I don't really understand DePaul's thought process here. Yeah, and I'm 100% on board with you. If you replace this Jin with a Sivir, mm -hmm. I think that while it's- This DePaul's composition, composition looks great with a Sivir. It's like, it's not perfect, but mm -hmm. it patches so many holes. Oh, we don't want to get Dove. We'll be the ones to engage with Sivir ultimate. Oh, we're afraid of getting into this backline. Well, we're just going to speed past the Aatrox and the Zach. It feels like it just patches so many holes that this Jin is leaving wide open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just, I feel like you drafted a very consistent core mm -hmm. in the terms in terms of Orin Trundle. That's a great one too, right? It, it says we're going to play for, we're going to weak side, top side, we're going to play for bot lane, and we're going to relentlessly pressure you, right? And they then proceeded to sort of pick champions that they can get that early game pressure but they just don't do enough with it right this you need something that can get the early pressure and then snowball it like a kaisa i would have absolutely loved kaisa here because kaisa has that level of in the early game her passive and her w just do so much damage in the early game she builds a dirk she can go dirk early for collector she can go that hail of blades build possibly because all that matters is killing the jinx and the lulu so you can go for that burstier build and still have enough dps to get through the aatrox and the zac eventually yeah and but just we doesn't just look like that's there i don't love it yeah, just do not love exactly what we're seeing out of DePaul. But we said that last time, and they proved yeah. us wrong. We'll see if they can prove us wrong again. Yeah, absolutely. Or if Butler's team fighting will be able to come out on top as we're going to go to a quick break, let the spectator delay wrap up, get the lobby all set up, make that map look pretty, and we'll be right back with this match between Butler and DePaul. And welcome back to Butler versus DePaul. Butler in the blue, DePaul in the red once again. And we called last game a draft diff. This really feels like a draft diff. I literally reached out to one of my buddies who's a coach for one of our school's teams. And he was yeah. just a little confused. He's, he's like, Aatrox Akali 2v8 this game. And I agree. I honestly feel like that's just how this plays out. Yeah, I agree. Normally, like when you're casting, right? It's sort of your job to be optimistic. You always want to look for the silver lining, and so I really try and do that the best I can. And I will say, I think if Jin gets fed enough, he might be able to take over the game, right? If yeah, he gets fed enough and stays out of range of Zack, he might be able to just blow up the Jinx. And then once Jinx dies, Levi probably trade kills him. I'm not going to lie to you. But... They kind of start maybe running out of damage, like maybe the maybe Reaper starts being able to take over the fight. 
drain tanking against the uh, the Aatrox, stealing the stats from the Zac. Like, there's a world, but I really kind of have to reach. To me, this is... DePaul is relying on reaching that silver dollar amount we were talking about last game. You gotta have, like, just a gigantic yeah, gold lead. You gotta take out a burlap bag with some dollar signs on it and just mm -hmm. swing that at your opponent's computer and hopefully it breaks their monitor. That's mm -hmm. the game plan. Just get a gold lead and win because at certain points, it doesn't matter what your champs are if they are so fed that they just one-shot you because even though Jin struggles against tanks, Jin two items ahead of your tank, it, it's going to be a difference. There's, be fine. You're, you'll be fine. But I just don't see those avenues either unless... Reaper gets this bot lane really far ahead, which we can see is already pathing for, is going that top to bot three camp, four camp clear. But now with this shove, there isn't necessarily that opportunity, and I'm struggling to find those early opportunities that Reaper found last game. Yeah, this is what I was talking about last game, where I wanted him to play for bot side, but with this poke setup and not an all-in setup in the bot lane, it would have to be a dive, right? The way you play out this bot is you stay shoved up. Ooh, a little bit of trade mid lane. But you stay shoved up bot lane, you keep Carthago under tower, you keep making new damage like this, already having to blow the Lulu's heal, right? And then he'll drop down CS, and you'll just build a CS lead and an EXP lead, and slowly just bring him out of the game. <gasps> Levi's dash are cancelled. He has to flash. Okay. Big pillar. Big resource. Really big pillar. pillar. But even now, we see King and Mason kind of mispositioning. They're actually falling behind on the damage. It is two pots to one remaining for King and Mason because he has that boot start. But still, this bot lane is not going the way they want as it looks like it's going to be a dive attempt here. This is very risky, but if it works, it's incredibly good for them. Yeah, very, very risky. Going to have to dance that tower aggro, but instead it does... off. Yeah, it, it's just going to be Reaper playing for the hover, playing to see if Nat Dog wanted to go for a collapse. He's actually sticking around, makes it a little scarier, but Nat Dog spotted up in the mid lane. Will be a reset for both junglers, and yeah, this is pretty even across this is even across the board. Malin is playing weak side, of course a weak side for the bot lane of Butler, mm -hmm. but no one's going down early, and this is a great start for Butler. Yeah, that gank attempt really sets Reaver behind on tempo. We see it's 29 CS to 20, and Nat Dog is just now getting the reset off, whereas Reaver was able to get the reset off earlier. So he's going to be back out on the map earlier, but he's just permanently going to be down, you know, two camps worth of gold in stats. We see that refillable potion, that control ward. That's sort of the difference being made here for uh, Nat Dog's recall versus Reaper. And the clears are just going to be coming back up faster for Nat Dog as well, right? It's all about rotating your camps, keeping it moving in the jungle. And when you're spending so much time walking all the way from Gromp to the bot lane and then spending 20 minutes sitting there, bad, but we have a play topside. We have a play topside. Malin's going low, but Reaper trying to collapse, trying to find the response. Noodly needs this kill in order for it to be even, or otherwise it's another first blood for Reaper as it's a repeat of the top side, but the Aatrox isn't the one benefiting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This looks very interesting. Mystic. It's going to have to be a flash. Oh. And he gets tagged. He's going to get pulled back. He gets tagged, does get pulled back. He's in range of the choppers, gets rooted up, and this is just going to be a kill for Butler as Papa oh, Jester going no. to be the one to find that kill. Unfortunate, it didn't go on to a carry, but still kill for kill across the map. Oh, it's still huge, right? When you have this early game snowball-oriented bot lane, setting them behind, right, blowing almost all of their summoners and still getting the kill is going to be incredibly valuable. You want it to go on the Jinx or the Akali. It's a little sad it went on to Papa Jester, but it's really not the end of the world. Snap Dog looks for another gank, burns another flash, and we see him having an incredible amount of pressure, right? He's up tempo on Reaper and he's still just doing completely fine on farm, right? Yeah, is up, is keeping pace with farm. Honestly, Nat Dog is feeling like how we were talking about Reaper last game, where it was finding advantages across the map. It was burning summoners while not falling behind. Because Reaper wasting so much time potentially prepping for that bot lane dive and it not quite working out has, again, as you said, put him so far behind and has allowed Nat Dog to just step out onto the map and influence everywhere else. 
Yeah, even if we compare the ganks that succeeded by both junglers, right? One of them went top lane and helped your Aatrox or and helped your Orn do a little bit better into an Aatrox. And Butler's gank bot lane saved a losing lane and just guaranteed a scaling opportunity, right? Like even if we compare both ganks that succeeded, Butler's gank was still higher quality. Yeah, it's it's about those higher quality moments. And looking forward to that later game, as we said, Butler's a team that just needs to make it to those team fighting moments and they can succeed if given the opportunity. And now this is a great early game start and there really aren't any positions that they would feel forced to fight over as now they're taking advantage in the bot lane. They're taking advantage somewhat in the mid lane. They're keeping pace with this Ari who's supposed to be poking out the Akali. So great stuff all around the board. Yeah, I mean, Akali just has such great base regen, and with that Doron shield, you can't get these all-in extended trades when you're playing R. You can only go for that poke, and this fleet footwork, Doron's shield, base health regen Akali setup is going to be completely fine eating that poke. It does mean there will be no electrocute for later on, right? It's a very lane-oriented room setup. However, you don't really have to shred people. Akali is kind of known for overkilling people anyway. As this top lane trade, Reaper's on his way up. Noodley is not really shredding down Malinich. Yeah, it is going slow, and now there's the Ornhorn overextension from Noodley. Does pop the World Ender, but it's not going to be nearly enough. Those brittle stacks do quite a bit of damage, and Reaper sinks his teeth into another kill on the Dark and top side. Is again another response bot lane, and Mystic's barely able to escape off the blast plant. Yeah, it's just, I feel like it's poor recognition from Noodley, right? Your Zac is playing for bot, you know you're going to be weak-sided top lane, and so he got a great trade, and if he just cashed out the damage and used the pressure to get a lead, it would be great, but he's just getting a little bit too greedy in these plays and getting punished for it. But once again, right, it's... Oh. Okay, Adjustair is able to make it out alive, Ari's fine, but... Like, it's these plays top lane, right, where like, even though these plays look good, and the kills are going to Reaper, which is where you want them. You don't want them on your Orn. It's still top pressure is so much less valuable than the bot pressure that Mad Dog is getting. This game. Yes, it, it is just a matter of where you want your pressure on the map, where you want to be winning, and where you need to be winning. Although I will say, Reaper getting ahead on the Trundle is a very scary prospect Reaper looking ahead to these uh, early game fights. Because again, he's about. Only about 500 up on the Zac, but that's still enough of a lead to mean earlier Mythic, to mean first um, Mythic in the game, as he's got highest gold in the lobby. So there's a few things to be concerned with, and on top of that, does have the Herald and can try to snowball or bring back this bot lane and, and find a lead for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the core issues with this team composition for Depaul is their low damage across the board, and getting Trundle your gold, he's going to be your highest DPS champion on the team, so it gives you potential to get through this Zac or get through this Aatrox. It is definitely redeeming. However, as this dragon fight starts up, it's a 4v4. Baldur has complete position, though. Yeah, I don't think that the fall really wants Just to go so for this. They Carthago's do drop the Ash Arrow. Yeah. Instant cleanse means that Carthago's not going to be at risk. Papa Jester has to flash away from the fight. Carthago starts things off on the Agister, and Levi continues to go mad on the Mystic as Reaper and King Amazing forced to fall back as some great reactions turn into a fantastic fight for Butler. Yeah, Carthago would absolutely zero hesitation to saying, you know what, you got me, you got my summoners, I'm gonna flash, I'm gonna cleanse flash away. But the fight still looks good, right? You can't engage. You got my summoners, but now your engage is gone. And DePaul just wanted blood. They went in anyway. They almost got Jester, but he was able to flash away from that fourth gin shot. And then from there on, it was just the Levi show. He absolutely blew up Mystic complete one shot and that's pre-mythic it's mm -hmm. just that akali damage oh, it is akali as you said that so overkill potential damage. it's just so much damage and even most of the damage onto agister which was that first kill of the fight that carthago picked up most of it was levi as well mm -hmm. it's just this akali going huge and we know why it was banned away last game is one thing you mentioned in draft is because they banned the seraphine because mm -hmm. they got rid of these uh picks from the previous game 
it means that the comfort for Butler is able to shine. Yeah, Levi Zakali is sort of famous within the league. He's a veteran of league. He's been around for a very long time. And he's always had this pocket pick. He's even been known to play it top lane. He's been known to lane swap with his top laner and go Akali top if the matchup is good enough. He just loves this champion and we can see why. He's doing so, so well on it as everyone's rotating to the spot play. DePaul might be getting collapsed on very hard here. I might get collapsed on, but the thing is, Papa Jester was on a rope timer topside, although Nathog able to start the fight while the tower is still alive. Mystic Low brought lower by the Death Rocket, but it's not enough as Levi is to fortify the bot side. Is up top, Nukli continuing to build that pressure, and there's the curtain call looking for Nathog to start things off and will not find that kill. Will pop the passive, and now with the tower gone, Likely mean a Zack off the map, though Levi wants to keep the fight going. Huge fight in the middle, knocks up two. Second ulti only gets one tick, but a shutdown onto Reaper means tower traded for kills. Oh no, Noodley wants more, but it's gonna go down! Oh no. <laughs> it's this game is so funny to watch because the top laners are just fist fighting each other. Malinich is dominating his lane opponent, right? Even then, it was Mythic Advantage for Noodley, who was able to almost get the kill, but then we look at the bot side, and once again, it's Levi coming up huge. It's Mad Dog with a fat engage. This is what I was talking about in Champ Select, right? This Ash just has no way to play around his Zac being on the enemy team. He positioned, you know, relatively far back, but he just got completely destroyed by getting jumped on from, you know, a screen and a half away. Yeah, and this Ash. Post laning phase is really just a vision and enchanted crystal arrow bot. There's yeah. nothing else that she can do. She can't respond to the Zack engage. She can't make space. She's just trying to slow things down, and Levi and Nat Dog do not care. They're just gonna dash into your backline. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, maybe if Hawkshot revealed invisible targets, it would be different, but. We saw in that fight, Levi actually did get hit by crowd control. He got charmed, but he W right before the charm hits. And then, like, look at this composition for the side of DePaul. If you can't auto attack the Akali, what do you do? You know? Yeah, there really isn't that much that you can do against this Akali because I think the only other option is you get the clip off of the Ornhorn. But even still, that relies on, one, the setup from DePaul being there, the read on the team fight, and the Sakali not finding a flank angle, where with Teleport, with the vision control that Butler uh, is going to develop for some of these fights, will just be so tough to do. Yeah, absolutely. It is it is a gold lead for DePaul, surprisingly, right? This top lane pressure is netting an overall gold lead. However... It's a little deceptive because when you're the late game scaling team versus such an early game focused team from DePaul, if you're down only a thousand gold by 20 minutes, you're winning the game, right? Yeah. Because you're just champion scaling is worth more than that gold differential. One thing I will say though, of course, is as everyone knows, there is the ornaments, there is that Orn uh, sort of late game insurance policy, but it doesn't matter if Nat Dog is stepping forward, but misses the clip, has no passive, will just go down as a questionable engage without Levi from Butler. Yeah, I see the attempt. Oh. Okay. Mistake goes down for the Death Rock, and now the fight Orn had a chance to roam down. Down, Nukli's on the response. Curtain Call finds a couple shots on the Cartago, is trying to flash away, flash. does do so. Agistair cleansed off from the charm, and now it's an awkward position. Levi locked up, but Nukli now in the middle of the fight. That Aatrox has the Gore Drinker, has the healing, has the drain tanking option, but where's the rest of the damage? Finds one, dive in onto the other, and Levi will fall. Papa Jester tries to keep the Jinx alive, but there just was not enough. Nat Dog respawned and rejoins the fight. Magister slowed up as across the board. I think that's a four for four. I I mean Ash respawned. I think. Ev oh, Orin lived. Yeah, Mountain four for four. I think four for three. I don't even. I've lost count, but it all comes back. It all comes back to the Aatrox. It all comes back to the Aatrox. Um. 
I'm getting worried it was 4-3. Thank you, producers, who uh, are more vigilant than I am. Uh, it all comes back to the Aatrox, though. This is what I was talking about in Champ Select. This is what I was talking about. No one can kill him. We saw King Amazin get the kill on the Carthago. We saw Levi stuck in fight. By the way, Levi wasted so much time. He was inside of DePaul's backline at 100 HP for, I have to say, like, 15, 20 seconds. It was That's so insane. hard to kill him. And eventually he did go down, right? King Amazin got a lot of gold. He got kills, but nobody can kill Noodley. This gore drinker, he got two or three of them off during the fight. He has passive hits. He has Q hits. His R is healing him. And it's just so impossible to put down the damage to kill the Aatrox if your uh, Trundle isn't alive. Yeah, there just isn't that damage, there isn't that DPS, and it's great targeting. As we can see in the gold, Reaper significant lead over Nat Dog, but Noodley responding to Malinich off of those uh, kills he picked up in the fight. And the only real deficit is in that bot lane, Carthago down about 700, but now you've got a bit of a fight engaged from Noodley. Might have thought he's a little stronger than he realistically is. More drinker for a decent chunk, but now shut it's down shut down straight into Reaper. Reaper's pocket. Yeah, I think Reaper is the best target for the shutdown right now as well. So I think that's incredibly valuable as he's walking up very far here though. He is pillar though, I think, so he should be fine. And he just walks away as it's a clean pick giving over a lot of gold to the side of DePaul. It's a 45 on the map. I want to see what they're going to be able to do with it. I want to see as well. Malinich though, continuing to open the gates, has just been sitting in this bot side. Will get about half this tier two tower and that's one thing i've also noticed from depaul is that while their team fighting is strong and their their team play is solid it's their map recognition it's knowing that if we can't necessarily be winning 5v5s we need to have side lane pressure we need to have outs as the herald pressure that we've seen they've been trading away uh dragons for heralds and it's so that they can break open the map and they can find picks because Realistically, they don't have many ways of winning otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. It's so annoying. Everyone who's played solo queue is going to know. Like, when the enemy team knows how to split push properly and just wave clear and wait for that side laner to get pressure, it feels so miserable. You just feel like there's nothing you can do. Every decision feels like it results in you losing something somewhere. And it's so annoying. And it's DePaul is just doing so well at accomplishing that, although I think Levi might be able to fist fight Malinich if the fight goes long enough and Levi's able to get healing out of that fleet forward. He's trying to. Can't quite find the angle and it is going to be a handshake bot side. But now that the, the map is pretty even, this gold lead has settled at about 1.5k at the 20 minute mark. Where do each of these teams want to go now that Baron will be the next threat on the map? Yeah, so it's like a 1.6, 1.7k lead for DePaul, which is very nice. However, if we look at the side of Butler, their gold is where it needs to be, right? It's all on the Jinx and the Akali. That's who has the gold and the Aatrox, right? That's who has the gold for the side of Butler. Whereas when we look at uh, DePaul, right, one of their richest members is this Orn, who, I mean, he does well with stats, but he's not going to be the one who wins you the team fight. So it's kind of precarious to look at. And moving forward, it's going to be a lot of priority on this Baron take. DePaul can absolutely destroy Butler in a team fight if Butler tries to start Baron, gets that damage down debuff applied to them, take some damage, and most notably gets flanked, right? Because you need your frontliners to be tanking the Baron, and that opens up the opportunity for an Ash Arrow to hit somebody like Carthago or somebody like Jesser, and then the play can go really well. There are options instead. Oath of Carthago Summoners is huge, oh my god. Yeah, that's massive. I was going to say, we're in a bit of an ARAM setup as both teams are just waiting for this Drake spawning in 30 seconds. Once again, it's Malinich in the side lane while mm -hmm. Noodley is group. He's the one farming, getting that pressure. Dragon's not up for another 30 seconds. They have a little bit of a window here. Oh, what a charm to deny Nat Dog's engaged, but they still want to keep going. Butler's got Noodley in the back line. They're pushing players back. Agistair is so far away, but so is the rest of the team. Carthago looks for a first reset on a King Amazing, but can't find it. No one's gone down on the side of the fall quite yet. They've split the fight, they've split 
the lane, they've split the opportunities, and now Butler is running for their lives, and that will be Papa Jester's curtain call. Absolutely beautiful charm by Adjuster. It's what, a year ago now? Maybe two they made that change? Where charm now cancels dashes in motion? It completely shuts down the engage from that dog. Gets him low before the fight even starts, and negates all of his crowd control, right? Because he's not even in our range. And then from there, Noodley gets a little too overconfident. He says, you know, they're low damage, I'm Aatrox, I can go in here. But his team is still so far away, and uh, the side of Depaul is kiting backwards more and more. Butler can't catch up, and it's just Aatrox stuck in a literal 1v5. I said, you know, this side of Depaul doesn't have the damage to kill Aatrox. Well, if you 1v5 him for a full 10 seconds uncontested, he's gonna die. We saw that fight. It took a long time for Nuke to go down, but eventually it happens. And from there, this Jinx doesn't have the damage she needs yet. This Hurricane, right? It's great at dealing damage in an AoE. It's great at fighting multiple targets, but it's not going to kill any single person nearly as well as a Phantom Dancer does, which means if no one else on your team is getting those kills, you're not getting the reset, you're not popping off, and you promise Carthago stunned up by an amazing air from the Oh, and it, and it was a planned bait with Nat Dog waiting in the wings, but there's just too much damage, too much chain CC. And now that's going to be Nat Dog falling. Papa Jester soon to follow. Rooted under tower followed up with a charm, and that's just going to be a chomp out of the Lulu. And DePaul now with a Baron opportunity. Yeah, Baron opportunity. Butler is just chain dying. They're getting picked off one by one here, and it's staggering their. Uh... Death timers as well, it's getting so much pressure off the map. The problem with this Baron take, once again, they don't have Baron damage either. This is taking so long. Levi's already respawned, he's already in the pit. Noodley is in mid lane, right? It's only 6k health, it's only half dead. I think uh, Butler thinks this is dying faster because they actually did have the time to get up here and possess it. Keeper's almost dead. Levi's like, what's going on? Can I go check the pit? But because they didn't have vision, they weren't able to actually figure out what was going on. I think Butler absolutely had an angle to go engage onto the Paul there, even if it was a 3v5 potentially. But that lack of vision in the pit meant they were unconfident in how fast it was actually dying. Yeah, and that's another point that I want to commend to Paul on this game is they knew that they did not have the late game. They knew that they don't have the capacity for some of these 5v5s at the very least as it stood at a pretty even game so they've been leveraging their other advantages the individual skill of players like Agister just able to find these picks and find these stuns and deny the engages as well as just their team vision control being led by their core three of Reaper, Agister, and King Amazing who've been playing together for I want to say at the very least the last two years. Oh at least two I think three or more potentially they are very very good together did Adjuster used to be a support, right? Didn't he? I believe so. I actually did yeah. roll swap, I believe, uh, a year and a half ago. His mid lane has been really amazing. Oh! Been fantastic. Great patch. Now, there's an opportunity, but Levi chunked so, so hard. Ignited now about to die. Zonia's in the shroud. No one can see it, but it provides time. Provides an escape, and now there's the resets to start. Carthago's excited, but no one else on DePaul is near enough as still a solid pick to stem the bleeding. Levi is baiting masterfully. Uh, completely calculated play. Uh, <laughs> absolutely zero worries popping the stopwatch there. Uh, his entire team engages over his golden body. Lulu gives him a shield to make sure no stray damage kills him. And they're able to clean up the fight. It is, at the end of the day, only one kill, but it was a kill on to King Amazon. They cash in a shutdown, they get that Baron off of him, and most importantly, they stall a lot of time from this Baron. When the enemy team has this buff and you get a pick, right, not only does it remove the buff from the champion, they don't want to take a 4v5, so you have to wait out that entire death timer the entire time he runs back, and then you can keep playing, and by then your Baron's already half gone, if not more. It's so awkward. Incredibly awkward is now? Really like, just from getting... Snowbook. 
1v1 by Malinich. Not sure about using that exhaust. Maybe it was just to get the, the summoner swap as Carthago once again double sums mispositioning and DePaul take that advantage. I mean, yeah, like when I was talking about this Ash, I just sort of had this assumption that he would all that uh Carthago would always have this beefy frontline in front of him. And that's just not happening. We're not seeing it so many great arrows for Mystic, even if they're not resulting in kills. A couple have, but even if they're not, are resulting in both sums being blown. And when Jinx doesn't have sums, it gets so much harder to play a teamfight out. Exactly. Ruvuar burned as well as Dragon is spawning. It's gonna be awkward here. Very awkward. Mm -hmm. As DePaul dragging out, but now I actually teleport the teleport completely. Completely. Malinich teleporting in as well, but Malinich is further away. He's on a flank angle though, but no ultimate Malinich. No Ornhorn was used in that earlier fight, but at the angle out of Papa Jaster. Noodly, buying time up front, waiting for Levi to find a position. Mystic's already pushed out of the fight, as now Levi steps forward. Mega like Deathmark finds none, but Levi gets the kill on the Reaper. Bye bye DPS, as Mystic will soon fall by the guns of Carthago as he is excited. He wants more, and Levi continues to die. King Amazing gets a quick response. And now those fourth shots might start to deal some damage, but Noodley will not die. That drain tank Darkin continues as Butler find themselves squarely back into this game. Butler, before that fight started, down around 5,000 gold, able to find an incredible four for one fight. It actually looked pretty good at the start for the side of the wall. They were able to instantly pop Nadog, get him into blobs, but they weren't able to actually finish off the blobs because the rest of Butler was coming up to clean up the fight to protect him. And from there, so much of the utility from the side of the wall was blown on Jester, who ended up surviving. No one was looking at Carthago, Levi didn't actually kill anyone, but was able to put down an incredible amount of damage and cause a lot of chaos, disrupt the fight, and that was enough for Carthago to just stack up the lethal tempo and start getting those resets off. And now, look at his inventory. He's on three items. He's on that Jinx spike, and it's going to get so hard for anyone to stop this damage from getting pumped out. The dragon even goes to the side of Butler, putting them on soul point, which means objective plays are going to be pretty much mandatory for DePaul. They can no longer give an objective and trade pressure somewhere else on the map. Yeah, because now you're looking at Noodley with an Ocean Soul. You're looking yeah, at Mad Dog with an Ocean Soul. Even Levi with an Ocean Soul. Like, he is in Shroud for so long, he can reach a lot of HP during that time. Help. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh. This is looking up for Butler as, again, we keep mentioning it. If they can make it in a decent position, two team fighting points in the game, they're able to find these opportunities and find these fights and position and push out the time. And DePaul put together a very risky draft that relied on them getting very far ahead. And while it was looking good, there's just not that DPS to deal with Noodley. Yeah, another very important thing to fit, point out here, by the way, Noodley finished his death dance. Notably, oh. he had no armor. He was on Merc Treads, Thor Drinker, Black Cleaver. So in these fights, we were seeing King Amazon actually being able to pump a relatively large amount of damage into him, and Noodley was getting chunked very low in these fights, but now with that death dance, getting a lot of armor, a lot of damage delay, getting resets and healing, it's going to be so much harder for King Amazon to actually contest Noodley anymore. And that, that, that gets even scarier, thinking about tacking an Ocean Soul on top mm. of that Aatrox. Ocean and Soul just negates the death dance effect, right? Like, yeah, because they just, you just, you, you never lose health. You, yeah. you don't have any health to, to regain. You're just full health the whole game. As once again, Malinich burning uh, a sum, burning ghost this time. Swap it out with that spellbook. Yeah, spellbook and... is a uh, spellbook is one of those summoners uh, runes where it's like you need to play it for like 50 games to really be able to use it well. You cannot just pick spellbook. It yeah, feels like... so awkward when you have it, but if you can use it properly, it's so valuable. You have to sink a decent amount of time into it, and of course these players have, they practice together, they Absolutely. work together, they figure out these compositions, they test this stuff, and 
Now I'm just really, really intrigued to see this Baron dance that's starting to develop, how it's going to work out, because now Reaper's further behind. Oh, that's a Arrow out of barely misses. Goes wide. Now big resources gone from the side of DePaul. Malinich staying in the side lane, contesting Noodley, but now on these three items, especially with Malinich dropping a lot of gold into magic resistance, Noodley is going to take a pretty commanding lead in the side lane split push fights, and so it's going to turn to Malinich to more just be on wave clear duty and not let Noodley pressure towers more than anything else. Yeah, it is going to come down to that denial because I think that's one of the big things that's keeping DePaul in this game is they have still their full outer ring. They have used their vision incredibly well to keep the side of Butler contained to their own half of the map as now with Baron, they're just going to go for the call. They're just going to force it. This one's dying Butler a lot faster than the last one. Two, one third down. Butler's just pulling up halfway and they just pull off. They didn't even get Noodley's teleport, and now all of their vision is going to go away. Those pink wards you spent good money on are going to get cleared out. There's still one in the back of the pit, but the rest of it is gone. Butler reasserts control of the area, and now all the eyes turn to Dragon. This is the Ocean Soul fight about to happen. This is what we've been talking about for the past five minutes. If this goes to Butler, if it's a one fight, if it's a Nat Dog steal, it becomes a monumentous task to kill anyone inside of this Butler composition. Exactly. We talked about how little damage there was already, and you stack what feels like infinite healing at times on top of it, and that mountain just grows even larger as That's Malinich. Actually an ocean. It is an ocean, but it's a, a metaphorical mountain. I realized I realized my mistake <laughs> when I said it, but now Malinich teleported to the bot side. Both teams want to fight. I don't think they realize Noodley's in the pit. Now they Trap spots me. Noodley's just hitting the dragon. Malinich has a great flank, but I don't know if an Orn flank is considerably valuable. This oh. wall, though, is pressuring him. Stopwatch blown by Noodley. It did pull the Drake out of the pit, as this is just incredibly interesting setup. Malinich finally pressing the go button, and now Noodley with the opportunity to get this big knockup, and now. Nat Dog bouncing around the back line, but there's no damage for Glago still being denied by Malinich in the back line as Levi can't quite do enough. Reaper has to go down. There's no reset. There's no jinx. There's no opportunity. Noodley trying to drink tank all that he can, keeping King Amazing in the back line, but there is no opportunity for Butler to get the DPS down. And now it's all going to be in the back of a Nat Dog steal, or we have to wait another five minutes as a finally a one fight for DePaul. I mean, incredibly well played by Malinesh, putting up just an MVP performance in that team fight. It's Nat Dog looking for a steal, though. I'll talk about that later. His E is on cooldown. Oh, not quite able to. Mistimed it. And it's going to be a stall. However, there's nothing that DePaul can really get besides that dragon, right? So they get a lot of gold, but they're already starting to kind of cap out on items, right? DePaul is going to be running out of slots to spend gold on. This gold lead's going to start meaning less and less as this game continues to progress. And continue to progress it shall. There is really no end in sight here. But I will say... One point that I was very impressed by with Nepal in that last fight was while an Orn flank isn't necessarily what you want for winning the team fight, it is it what you want for pressuring so hard, the Jinx. Yeah. It was Absolutely. so crucial to that fight because it meant that Carthago was constantly dealing with two fronts, and this either means Butler have to place themselves in a true front to back, or they need to split their front line, neither of which feel very good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Malinich completely won the team fight for his team there. He solo zoned off the Lulu and the Jinx, didn't even reach half health 1v2ing them in the process. And then even despite all of that, Noodley almost just got a triple kill yeah. and reset, right? It was incredibly scary, incredibly close. King of Azen very nearly died. And if he went down, it would have been a lost team fight regardless. So if Malinich cannot do that again, if Carthago is allowed to participate at all in a team fight, it's gonna be really bad.
gonna be rough because I don't like that they've once again got the orange blank, but missing the orange horn, Garzago stays alive, but Jester first to fall. Now Garzago has enough potential opportunity to free fire redemption comes down, decent amount of HP, but there's just no damage, there's no healing, there's no front line, there's just domination out of DePaul as they find the opportunity off of a risky call. And now this will be towers, this could be barren. Big death timers, this could be game if it's fast enough. You talked a lot about how good Butler is at team fighting, but they have just been thoroughly out team fought this game. Time and time again, there were a couple Butler fights for sure, but overall, it was completely the DePaul show. They've been finding amazing engages. They're just gonna march in and end the game in a clean 2-0 that I really think no one was expecting them to win this game, and especially not in this sort of fashion. Definitely not in this sort of fashion, and it did just come down to that DePaul experience, that core roster that they have held together, and just this recognition that if Carthago is going to be left alone in the back line, we'll bring the front line to him instead of trying to dive, and it worked out. King Amazing could cut through Levi and Noodley, and that's all he had to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just a stellar performance from Malinich specifically. I know we can like look at King Amazon pumping out damage, and it's really easy to look at his scoreline and go, you know what, this guy was the MVP of the game. But in my mind, it was Malinich. He won his top lane matchup with, you know, a little bit of jungle interference, but he won his top lane matchup. He was getting a tremendous side lane pressure. He solo won multiple team fights for his team. His flanking was absolutely amazing. And we do actually have him waiting in the interview room. So we're going to take a quick little break, but do not go anywhere because we're going to be pulling him in and getting his thoughts on the game that just happened.